and this one. Uh, good, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, today, our uh, guest speaker uh, is uh, Ms. Barbara Stemping. Barbara uh, holds uh, her PhD from the Jagiellonian University, Kraków, uh, where she also works as an adjunct professor. Uh, during the period of 2014-2015, uh, uh, Barbara was a visiting uh, researcher at the Max Planck Institute of uh, Comparative Public Law and uh, International Law uh, at the Heidelberg University in Germany. Um, she was also a um, postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of uh, Legal Research uh, of the National Autonomous University uh, of Mexico in uh, Mexico City. Uh, she was also a director of uh, research department at the Electoral Tribunal of uh, Mexico City. Uh, uh, Dr. Barbara uh, was also working as a uh, professor at the Ibero-American uh, University in Mexico City and uh, visiting professor at the Inter-American Academy of Human Rights. Uh, Barbara is an expert in the field of uh, law of the seas and uh, maritime law. And uh, she has also very, uh, she has a maritime experience uh, and held various uh, uh, position in uh, maritime industry. Uh, she's a prof professional uh, yacht captain uh, with, uh, with more than 30,000 uh, nautical miles of uh, experience, uh, including crossing the Atlantic and the Equator. Uh, she, the, the, the professional uh, maritime experience, she links with, with her uh, legal research on the law of the sea and international maritime law. Uh, today, Dr. Barbara um, prepared this very interesting uh, topic. Uh, and she will talk about the autonomous and uh, unmanned, uh, uh, unmanned vessels uh, as a challenge to the law of the sea, uh, which I think it's a uh, it's, it's very uh, progressive topic, uh, very actual. And I'm really looking forward to uh, learn more from you, Dr. Barbara. And uh, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. It's a, a great honor for us. Uh, and now please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the first place, thank you very much for your kind invitation. For me, it's always a great pleasure when I can share my research on the law of the sea and international maritime law with the audience which is interested in this topic. And please let me share my PowerPoint presentation with you. Um, now you can see the PowerPoint. Yes, everything right. Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, yes. perfect. And today I would like to talk to you exactly about a very specific topic, a very new topic also, which is the autonomous and unmanned vessels as a challenge to the law of the sea. Uh, so as we know, the legal order prevailing at sea is composed basically by two main categories um, of law, two systems, we can say, which is the law of the sea on one hand and the international maritime law. The law of the sea, of course, it's a very complex, very broad system regime, depends how we see it. Of course, there is always a dispute in the doctrine, which is how is the exact proper terminology which should be employed. But um, the law of the sea is basically based currently on the doctrine of the international custom and on the international convention, very often called constitution of the oceans, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So on the one hand, we have the law of the sea um, order based on the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea regime. And on the other hand, we have the international maritime law, maritime system, which is a very complex system, which is composed by lots of international conventions and treaties, mainly adopted by the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, the organization which is specialized in all the shipping industry related matters. So it's a very dynamic organization which develops all the legislation, all the international treaties, recommendations, guidelines, etc., which uh, all together form the international maritime law. 
So the legal order prevailing at sea is composed by exactly the fundamentals, which is the UNCLOS Convention, the doctrine, the international custom, and all the international maritime legal conventions, mainly from the IMO, from the International Maritime Organization. So this is what gives the basis, which gives fundamentals for the operation of uh, ships, vessels worldwide. Of course, the law of the sea pertains to many um, other aspects. The UNCLOS Convention pertains to basically all human activities which occur at sea, such as the, uh, the limitation of maritime uh, frontiers, uh, the exploitation of natural resources. It's not only focused and focalized on the uh, shipping navigation, but of course, as we know, shipping and the maritime industry is a very important activity, industry, part, human activity, which occurs at sea. So even though this legal system prevailing at sea composed of the two branches, law of the sea and the international maritime law, is really very deep, very extended. There are lots of very detailed regulations. In both of them, we cannot find any regulations pertaining to the autonomous vessels and unmanned vessels, ships. So that's why today I would like to explain you and talk to you about how the existence of these autonomous and unmanned vessels, ships in other words, how it challenges the existing legal order prevailing at sea. But before we go into a bit more detailed legal analysis, it's very important that we exactly understand what we are talking about, that we exactly understand the terminology which is gonna be employed during this presentation. So to make it a bit um, closer to our hearts, I'm sure that lots of us, probably everyone heard about autonomous cars. Autonomous cars such as Tesla, for example, it's something that we could read about already since several years in the internet, we could see it in the uh, TV, uh, these projects, autonomous cars, which can drive themselves without the involvement of a human being uh, steering uh, inside, it's something that I'm sure that every one of us has somewhere there in their minds. So this is an autonomous car, um, an example of autonomous car. And in case of the autonomous vessels, the problem is very similar. We have a vessel, we have a ship, maritime vessel, of course, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm referring to the maritime industry, where there is no, or there is very limited involvement of a human factor, of a human person in the operation of a system. In uh, detail, I will touch it in a moment, but just that we have it present, autonomous cars, autonomous ships, it's something very similar. The point is, that the ship, the car drives, sails, operates with or with a very reduced involvement of a human factor. On the other hand, we have unmanned aerial vehicles, so-called drones. This is also something that most of us certainly already heard about or used it even. The aerial um, unmanned vehicles are principally uh, used by the army, as we can see in the screen, this type of um, flying unmanned drones, unmanned de facto uh, planes, uh, very often is used, for example, to, uh, for the surveillance or for any other activities uh, with the military character. But also very often we can see currently, for example, the kids playing with remotely controlled operating flying drones or adults or uh, teenagers which use this type of, we could say toys, but in fact, these are exactly the unmanned aerial vehicles for some pleasure, leisure purposes. So exactly here, the common denominator is the lack of human presence. Now we don't talk about the operational involvement, but about the human presence on board of such flying vehicles. And again, the situation with the uh, maritime vessels, sailing, cargo uh, type of ships is very similar. So in such a way, we get to the Flying Dutchman 
uh, in the or of the 21st century. Many of us have heard during uh, our childhood, I'm sure, uh, or even during the adulthood, uh, we've seen some movies about the ghost phantom ships crossing the oceans, the legendary uh, Flying Dutchman, which was a ship which is operating without any human present on board, which was operating herself without exactly the physical presence of people on board. And even though this is, of course, an old traditional legend, which inspired lots of movie productions, lots of uh, sailor songs, such shanties, which inspired lots of poems and books, we never thought that such a situation, a ship which operates without human involvement or human presence on board, could really exist. And current times proved exactly otherwise. Currently, exactly in the year 2021, already Yara Birkland, the ship which you can see on the screen, exists. This is a Norwegian project built by the partnership of the Norway um, companies such as Kronsberg and Yara, um, Kronsberg Maritime Yara uh, partnership. And this partnership constructed the first partially autonomous fully unmanned, we could say, zero emission of CO2, eco-friendly vessel Yara Birka. And that's exactly the reason why we are talking about the problem of autonomous and unmanned vessels today, why we are talking about the fact that the legal order prevailing at sea, that is the law of the sea with the principle, the most important convention on the law of the sea, and all the other international maritime conventions adopted by the IMO, by the International Maritime Organization, are not prepared for the introduction of such new technological solutions and the unmanned and autonomous vessels. So even though Yara Birkland is supposed to start her operation already by the end of this year, so this, this is not a project, this vessel already exists by the end of this year, so basically we talk about couple of months, this partially autonomous, fully unmanned ship is gonna start operating within the territorial sea of Norway. Why only on the territorial sea of Norway? Exactly because of the reason, because of the fact that the international legal order is not prepared for the operation of these type of vessels. Therefore, of course, within the national jurisdiction, within the national borders, countries can, of course, work on new projects, new pro technologies. However, the situation gets much more complicated if we would like to introduce this type of a vessel into the international traffic. Therefore, even though this vessel already exists and several other projects are also um, ongoing, uh, mainly in Japan, Japan is also very intensively working on the development of new technological solutions, new types of unmanned and autonomous vessels. Even though this is already happening, these solutions, technological solutions, they happen, they exist. They are very soon um, gonna be physically operating, even though the international legal order cannot receive them. It's not legally possible for this type of vessels legally to be able to be engaged in the international traffic, in the international voyages. And exactly this is the reason, that's exactly why uh, today I'm talking, I'm analyzing the problem, how this could be solved, how the international maritime law, how the uh, law of the sea could face these new challenges and how the international uh, community, mainly here, uh, also directed by the International Maritime Organization, could um, or would or should react to this changing reality. So going back to the terminological explanations, because this is very important in the context of our analysis, because very often this word such as automatic, autonomous, unmanned, we heard them, we have them somewhere here, we very often also tend to use them as synonyms, 
But this is very important that these words are not synonyms and a strict terminological distinction must be made in order to be able to provide durable legal solutions. It's very important, as we know, as for every type of law, as for every type of lawyer, to have a terminological clarity because without this, the legal solutions are just not correct for the situation which happened. So what does this word really mean? In the first place, we have the autonomous vessels, the autonomy of a vessel, what it means. As we can see on the screen, the definition is basically very simple. An autonomous vessel is a vessel operated by a system which undertakes its own decisions and actions based on conducted calculations and pre-programmed algorithms. So therefore, as we may see, the autonomy of a vessel refers to the operational independence of a system. So doesn't matter how many people we have physically on board of a vessel, or mutatis mutandis, how many people we have physically on board, for example, of a car or, a, or on a flying um, drone. The fact, the situation, the, the thing which matters is who takes the decision. In case of autonomous systems, the decisions are undertaken by the system. And of course, this is possible because the system, the computer system, has the pre-programmed algorithm, which can find the correct, or most of the time, correct solution to the situations which happen. So therefore, in a consequence, different levels of autonomy may be distinguished because, of course, as we may imagine, they are more advanced autonomous systems and less advanced autonomous systems. So therefore, a computer can be more competent can be pre-programmed better, the algorithm can be more advanced and therefore the level of autonomy will be higher or will be lower. And this, even though it seems very technical knowledge and this seems to be more related with the technical sciences, this is also very important to have these questions and these methods in mind exactly for the legal analysis. Therefore, among different levels of autonomy, can be distinguished by engineers even up to 15 different levels of autonomy. So you can imagine how complex systems and how complex issue that is. But of course, for the purpose of our legal analysis, for the purpose of the current um, presentation, of course, I just briefly want to present you four levels of autonomy related with the operational system of ships, because it's very important from the legal perspective. So decision support is the lowest level of a ship's autonomy, and this is exactly what's been happening on board of ships currently, traditionally. The decision support means that the system, that the ship is not operating herself. This means that there is a human captain, human officer on watch, there is human, human operational supervision of the ship, and there are only several systems which help, which exactly support the decision undertaken by a human. And this is exactly the situation which since many, many years has been passing, has been occurring on different ships worldwide. Then an automatic vessel or automatic actions on the ship just mean that certain isolated activities, actions can be performed in an automatized way. Let's pay attention, automatized, but not autonomous. Automatized action means that the machine system can just perform certain concrete activity. For example, loading, unloading cargo. Yes, on the ship we have a cargo, uh, autonom automatic system can grab that cargo and transport it back to the land. Or for example, other way around, we have a cargo on the land, a system can grab it and can put it on a ship. That's it. The ship, the vessel, the system cannot do anything else. The system cannot think, we could say, can only perform these isolated actions. And monitored autonomy is exactly already what is at stake, what is causing this legislative, regulatory barriers and problems. Monitored autonomy means that a system 
computer system is already smart enough, is already competent enough as to be able to navigate it himself. So as a consequence, the autonomy of this vessel is only monitored, supervised, we could say in other words, by a captain, by an officer on watch, officer in charge, by a remote operator. And this person, in case of any troubles, in case, for example, the system cannot perform, cannot find the best solution, this system uh, then is uh, overridden by the captain, by the officer in charge, by the remote operator. And finally, the full autonomy. And here we need to remember that in the case of the current technological development and ships, we don't talk about full autonomy at all. So whenever you hear that there is a fully autonomous ship, there is fully autonomous plane, there is fully autonomous car, this is just simply not happening. Fully autonomous system, any, uh, installed in a car, installed on a ship, installed in a flying drone, means that the system is able to fully operate without any human involvement. Therefore, in other words, we would need very advanced artificial intelligence systems which can just think themselves. So this is not happening. Therefore, once again, very often, all these words are used as synonyms. We mix them, we use them interchangeably, but they are not synonyms. And these terminological distinctions are very important also from the legal perspective in order to be able to propose concrete legislatory, regulatory solutions. So the other term which you are gonna hear today lots of times is the maining or unmaining level, unmanned vessel. An unmanned vessel is a vessel without a bridge crew. Let's remember that on a vessel, on a ship, a bridge is the place where the decisions are undertaken. On a bridge, this is the operational center of a vessel where the captain, when the officers, they do the watches there, they take their decisions, they, they operate from a bridge. So an uh, unmanned vessel is a vessel without bridge crew and with of, or without a very reduced presence of crew on board at all. And thus different levels of this maining and unmaining can be distinguished. So again, manned bridge as the center of the operational decision taking processes is a place which based on current legal order and legislation, regulations, international conventions must be always meant. <clears throat> Both based on the UNCLOS convention as well as other conventions adopted by the IMO, breach can at no time can never be left unattended. This is a general rule which has been employed and been used in the maritime industry and also which is uh, expected by the international legal regime as well national regulations M a bridge must be always meant there must be always a captain of an officer in charge on a bridge who can react to the situations that can occur at sea and is in charge of a vessel so meant bridge means in other words that the vessel is meant this is a normal current situation we can, however, distinguish another different level of maining, which is uh, when a bridge is unmanned, so the operational center of a vessel is unmanned, but a vessel is manned. So there are other crew members who are not responsible for the operational activities of a vessel, but they, for example, take care of a cargo. Let's suppose that a vessel transports animals, so, of course, during a sea voyage, it's important to be feeding the animals, which are the cargo in this case. So of course, someone needs to give the water, the food must feed the animal. But this crew, which is responsible for taking care of animals, doesn't do anything else. So this is the level two unmanned bridge, however, still with manned vessels. And finally, we have the fully unmanned vessel, which means that the vessel is unmanned, the bridge is unmanned, there is no human present on board. And for, the, uh, for our analysis, it's also important to mention that all these 
considerations, current considerations which I'm presenting you today and considerations which are present in the doctrine, they pertain to the cargo vessels. So they pertain to vessels which transport cargo and not passengers. As we may imagine, the fact that we have passengers on board on the vessel complicates the situation much more. Therefore, the autonomous element vessels so far are not um, considered to be adequate for the transportation of passengers. But of course, within next years, probably it will also evolve as everything is evolving. However, currently, Yara Beer Plant and other Japanese projects, which I mentioned to all of this, is related with the transportation of goods by vessels because, of course, this is the least risky, we could say. Of course, cargo properties and stake, however, not human life directly, so it makes it a bit easier. So, as a consequence, as you see, we can distinguish different categories of vessels which are going to be the combination of the operational autonomy and the meaning levels. So one is not a synonym of the other. Therefore, as you can see, we can have the uh, first vessel, which is the first category of vessel, this decision support movement bridge. This means a normal traditional vessel currently being employed in the international voyages. So the, man, the bridge is meant, the operational center of a vessel is meant, and human element, captains, officers on watch, officer in charge, uses advanced systems such as AIS, for example, so just computer systems which provide additional, uh, additional navigational information which supports the decisions of a captain. More um, forward, we can have automatic vessel with meant bridge. This, exactly as I explained to you, it's a vessel which can perform the certain isolated actions, such as, for example, automatic berthing and unberthing or loading and loading cargo, but there we is still meant uh, a human element on board on a bridge in charge of the operation. Next step is an automatic vessel with unmanned bridge. So here we already enter into the considerations on the vessel which starts to be unmanned, partially at least. The, the bridge operational center is unmanned and certain isolated actions can be performed auto in an automatized way, not autonomous, let's have it in mind, by a vessel. So at this level, you see that the meaning levels don't go exactly together with the autonomy. Yes, we can see this exactly what I'm trying to show you, that meaning is one thing, autonomy is different. So what happens in the case of automatic vessel with unmanned bridge if this vessel is not autonomous? Of course, we talk about involvement of a shore-based operator, remote operator who directs the vessel because if there is no operational autonomy, but there is neither human present on board, this means that actually a human must somehow operate this vessel. And yes, this happens remotely uh, from a shore. More um, advanced vessel type category of vessel is an automatic vessel with an un, uh, unmanned vessel. So there's totally zero people on board till the certain processes are automatized. Further, there is monitored autonomy with unmanned bridge. So here we already, as you remember, start talking about certain level of autonomy. However, there, is, there are crew members present on board, for example, taking care of cargo and monitored autonomy with unmanned vessel. And this means that a ship indeed operates herself. There is the supervision of a, for example, short base operator. There are no human present on board. A vessel, because of the pre-programmed algorithm, can undertake majority of decisions herself. And finally, we get to the fully autonomous and fully unmanned vessel, a vessel which just can do whatever she wants, take whichever decisions she can, based on very complex, very um, advanced pre-programmed algorithm, 
and involvement of the artificial intelligence. So this type of a vessel currently still do not exist. And therefore, in no cases I already mentioned to you, we can talk about fully autonomous and fully unmanned vessel. So exactly, we, have it, we need to have it very clear that the shore-based remote operator basically is always present in the context and in the conversations and considerations related to autonomous and unmanned vessels. That is, as the fully autonomous ships, they still do not exist. And a vessel is supposed to be fully unmanned. For example, like in the case of Yara Birkla, there must be a shore-based remote operator. So a person, an operator who is based on land, on shore, and who uh, via the remote controlled uh, systems, technological solutions can remotely control, remotely operate a vessel. So all this, what I'm talking to you uh, about, this all what I'm explaining to you, these are very um, complex technological considerations which impact very heavily the legal order prevailing at sea. Because as you may imagine, uh, inter an international legal order, international conventions, international maritime conventions especially, need to take into account all these considerations. Therefore, as you see, it's also not possible just to say that, ah, we have a new category of vessel, autonomous vessel. So just let's make a new legislation, new, for example, at the national level, or let's make new international convention pertaining to autonomous vessel. The topic is very complex. And because there are these different levels of autonomy, there are different levels of Mainly, all of this needs to be really taken into consideration at the level of the decision and law making. Therefore, as these new technologies and new advanced technological solutions, they've been already present uh, since several years. Of course, we know that this type of uh, technological solutions, they've been developing very, very fast. Already in the year 2018, the IMO, the International Maritime Organization adopted the strategic plan for the following five years, the plan for the years 2018-2023. And between the strategic directions of the organization, which should be, of course, reflected in the adoption of new international conventions, amendments to the existing ones, a new strategic direction to integrate new and advancing technologies in the regulatory framework was included. So the IMO Secretary General Kitak Lim also uh, underlined the importance of remaining flexible to accommodate the new technologies and so improve the efficiency of shipping while at the same time keeping in mind the role of the human element and the need to maintain safe navigation, further reducing the number of marine casualties and incidents. So this considerations related to the new type categories of vessels was already noticed by the IMO in 2018. And as a consequence, the IMO Maritime Safety Committee decided to start the regulatory scoping exercise, the RCE, which had for the, which had as an objective to determine how the safe, secure, and environmentally sound operation of the mass, what's mass, let's explain in a moment, may be introduced in the IMO instrument. So mass is the maritime autonomous surface ship. We'll go back to the previous screen in a moment, but currently let's just explain the final terminology which we need for this consideration. So maritime autonomous surface ship is the definition, is the, is the category of vessel established, introduced by the IMO. And IMO recently defined exactly this maritime autonomous surface ships as a ship or types of ships, which to a varying degree can operate independently of human interaction. So as a consequence, IMO Maritime Safety Committee established four different degrees of autonomy, of meaning. And as you can see on the screen, the IMO distinguishes 
the degree one, ship the automated processes and decision support. Degree two, remotely controlled ship with CFRS on board. Degree three, remotely controlled ship without CFRS on board. And finally, the degree four, fully autonomous ship. So this is the classification and these are the four categories of vessels which are foreseen by the IMO Maritime Safety Committee. But as you could see during my presentation, the topic is much more complex and these four categories of vessels, these four degrees of autonomy of vessels as, as it is stated by the IMO Maritime Safety Committee, it seems to be very limited and seems to be simply not enough to be able to adjust the existing vessels, to be able to adjust the existing technological solutions to fit them into this category. Regardless of this fact, um, let's, back, let's go back to the scoping exercise because these the, this definitions, these degrees of the mass vessels, the maritime autonomous surface ships were of course very important, were necessary to be able to develop a regulatory sco scoping exercise. So the IMO decided that exactly it must be decided, it must be stated, it must be explained which one of the existing IMO instruments, that is international conventions from the scope of the international maritime law, apply to mass and prevent mass operation. So which one to them apply to the autonomous surface ships and therefore are preventing the, uh, their operation and therefore stipulate regulatory barriers. Secondly, to determine if IMO instruments apply to mass and do not prevent mass operation and require no actions, because perhaps, who knows, of course, this is uh, what the uh, IMO Maritime Safety Committee was um, thinking at the moment, perhaps there are conventions which do not require amendments which do not require substantial changes and the maritime autonomous surface ships can easily operate and comply with the provisions of this of this international maritime treaties in the third place <clears throat> the scoping exercise um, aim to up, um, aim to determine if these IMO instruments apply to mass and do not prevent mass operation may, but may need to be amended or clarified and or may contain gaps. So the third group, according to IMO Maritime Safety Committee, was important to also determine that perhaps there are conventions which do not prevent mass operation, which do not stipulate a regulatory barrier. However, they may still need amendments because, for example, they have gaps or some gray uh, areas, gray spheres. And finally, to determine the full group of conventions from the field of international maritime law which have no application to mass and therefore they just simply are not a problem if we see it from the from the perspective of the operation of maritime autonomous survey ships so the maritime safety committee uh, took approximately two, two years to complete the scoping exercise the scoping exercise was also supposed to finish earlier. Again, the pandemic uh, of the COVID-19 delayed a bit the results of the scoping exercise. But finally, in May 2021, so just a couple of months ago, the Maritime Safety Committee approved the outcome of the RCE. And we can now consult this report online on the website of the IMO. And we can see which international treaties and conventions according to IMO Maritime Safety committee, require changes, do not require changes, apply to mass, do not apply to mass, prevent their operation or not, etc. So as you can see, the problem of autonomous and unmanned vessels is indeed very complex and the International Maritime Organization, the leading organization in the field of shipping industry is working currently just right now in a very dynamic, very intensive way to as soon as possible 
find the durable solutions in order to be able to allow to enable the operation of the autonomous and unmanned vessels in the international track. And why the autonomous and unmanned vessels can be or are so important and why also they can be so useful. Before, of course, lots of us could say that autonomous and unmanned vessels is just a new invention, just new technological solution, which should result or would result, unfortunately, for example, in the reduction of the employment um, of seafarers, reduction of the working um, positions, and that there is also a very high, very negative impact of the development of new technologies on the shipping industry and especially on human element. However, the recent and ongoing pandemic of COVID-19 proved that autonomous and unmanned vessels would actually stipulate an answer for this type of disasters, this type of um, pandemics uh, or other type of international problems or international crisis. So what really happened at sea in 2020? This is actually very important and it's also a bit surprising. Not all of us uh, have really a perspective about how much the pandemic of COVID-19 and the introduced restrictions, lockdowns, traveling restrictions, etc., how much really it affected the shipping industry in other words, all the human working on ships, all the human working on boards. Very often we tend to speak about the shipping industry, the industry, which is some unhuman conglomerate of commercial interest. Very often when we talk about any type of industry in this type of narration, we just forget that every industry, including the shipping one, is simply formed by all human working there, or workers, people, in this case, seafarers, working there, in this case, day and night, to transport goods and passengers across the world. So let's remember that more than 80% of merchandise worldwide has been transported by ships. So basically, none of us, not me, not you, not any one of you, can function, can live without the shipping industry. The life of every one of us, every single person on this planet currently is heavily dependent on the shipping transportation because it's simply not possible in the current times to transport the amount of cargo, food, corn, and natural resources in any other way than by ships. So 80% of the merchandise, let's remember, are transported by ships and in 2020, when the pandemic outbroke, approximately 1 million seafarers were working on approximately 60,000 large cargo vessels worldwide. That was the situation in September 2020. So let's remember when the pandemic outbroke, the pandemic started at least at the European continent, more or less in March 2020. The restrictions were introduced very fast, um, approximately also in March. So already, Four months later, in September 2022, still one million seafarers were working around the world on different ships, still transporting the goods worldwide because the interruption of the uh, maritime routes, the transportation chains which been occurring on sea would result in an absolute collapse of the national economies, international economies. This would have very severe uh, consequences for every one of us. But as a result of the heavy restrictions introduced by lots of countries, or majority of the countries in the world, suspend the crew, exchange, crew exchanges got suspended. So of course, as we know, the crews on board of the vessels, they function in a rotative way. So three months, on board, one month at home, six months of board, two months at home. They are different schedules, they are different reasons. So <clears throat> it happened that due to pandemic outbreak, due to travel restrictions, the crew exchanges got suspended. So approximately 400,000 seafarers got stuck on board on commercial vessels and could not return home. This resulted 
in a situation that more than a, um, than some CFRs were more than a year on board consecutively. This means that one person, plenty of them, but in this case, a concrete person was more than one year consecutively at work. And due to travel restrictions, suspension in exchanges of crews, et cetera, they could just not go, be able to go back home. They were just not able to um, travel. And the situation was caused mainly by the fact that by a very long time until basically December of 2020, so basically during the full year of pandemic, seafarers were not um, considered to be key workers and thus they were not exempt from the travel restrictions introduced by national legislations by respective countries. All this caused a humanitarian crisis at sea. Seafarers just basically became invisible, invisible victims, silent heroes, as the press was writing about. So in this type of situations, the autonomous and unmanned vessels, which would imply a limited involvement of human on board of the vessels, in, kind, in this type of situations, when a vessel or vessels could be remotely operated, all of this would mean much easier situation for the crews. This would mean much more safety for the crew members. This could be an answer for this type of situation. So especially after the last year, after the outbreak of pandemic of COVID-19, the autonomous and unmanned vessels became a very concrete, a very feasible solution and response for this type of crises this type of disasters, this type of um, catastrophe. So concluding, because uh, I think my time is already slowly finishing, we need to remember that autonomous shipping can and is an answer for natural disasters and severe environmental conditions. So as in the example of COVID-19, also, for example, autonomous and unmanned vessels can operate for example, in the Arctic or Antarctic, in the ice covered regions, could be involved in the polar navigation. As again, the main problem with operation and navigation in this type of regions is the safety of the human present on board and the exposure on the severe environmental conditions by them. However, as I was uh, repeating several times during this presentation, the distinction between autonomy and unmanning must be realized. Therefore, let's remember, manning, unmanning, autonomy, automatization, these terms are not synonyms. And in order to be able to provide durable legal solutions, these distinctions must be realized in order to avoid terminological confusion. As a consequence, uh, the recognition of different levels of autonomy and meaning is necessary. So furthermore, and I was explaining to you, it's not black and white. It's not that a vessel is autonomous or is not. Is meant or is not. No, it's, there is much bigger and wider spectrum of different options. There are much more levels, both of autonomy and of meaning which must be also considered by the international legal regulations, international conventions, must be considered by the international organization working on this topic. The presence of a shore-based operator is presupposed in a discussion on autonomous ships. Again, you see that on the screen, this autonomous ships um, is in uh, parentheses, exactly. Autonomous ships mean, ship means that there is no human involved in the operation of this vessel. When we have the involvement of a short base operator, this vessel is just unmanned and remotely controlled. So this means that a vessel is not autonomous. However, exactly, because how this problem is presented very often in the media, in the internet, including in some academic papers written by certain authors, very often when they use the, the term autonomous ship, they still write about short base operator. And thus now, you know, I know we will know that then indeed they mean a vessel which is fully unmanned but has no uh, operational autonomy. 
a master and a crew stipulate the core of international maritime regulations. This is a very important phrase which perhaps summarizes the all international um, regulations prevailing at sea. A master and a crew stipulate the core of them. So therefore, the operation of autonomous and unmanned vessels constitutes not only regulatory barrier per se, but requires a complete rethinking of centuries of maritime traditions and customs. So the other day when I had the pleasure to discuss the problem of autonomous and manned vessels, for example, with the Colombian Navy um, in uh, Cartagena de Indias in Colombia, there were lots of specialists, lots of law of the sea um, experts and lots of practitioners, captains, commanders of Navy vessels. And for all of these experts, maritime professionalists, the idea that a vessel can be fully unmanned, that there can be no captain, there can be no crew on board, is simply revolutionary. Of course, everyone understands it. Of course, you understand it. I understand it. Everyone understands what it means that there is no people on board of a vessel. But if we see it from the perspective of hundreds of years of maritime traditions, standards, and customs, the idea that suddenly there won't be a captain and crew on board is simply revolutionary. So the problem is not really only related with the regulatory barriers. The problem is not only related just with amending international conventions, but requires also amending something much more important, the way how the uh, people think, how the seafarers think, how the industry is based and how it functions. Therefore, the adoption of new international sister conventions may be an adequate solution. Let's remember that in the field of the international maritime law, we have certain conventions which are so-called sister conventions. So there is, for example, uh, uh, the international conventions of standards on certification um, and watch keeping of seafarers. And there is the sister convention exactly on the standards of qualification, certification, and watch keeping for seafarers for CFAR working on fishing vessels. So we have one convention and then the same convention just adjusted to a particular type of vessels. So perhaps in terms of autonomous and unmanned vessels, this could be also a durable solution. And finally, the international maritime legal order lacks the answers which must be promptly delivered exactly as um, how I started this presentation. This is already happening. Yara Birkland already exists. Japanese projects are on the way. Very soon we'll have fully operative, partially autonomous, fully unmanned, remotely operated vessels, which are not gonna be able to operate worldwide exactly because of the lack of the international legal regime, which is gonna enable. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that this presentation puts some new light, some interesting light on the problem of autonomous and unmanned vessels. Okay, uh, Dr. Barbara, thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, extremely interesting uh, presentation. I think I would have to go through this uh, one more time to, to, to actually understand uh, what, uh, what exactly, uh, what kind of requirements uh, the, the vessel has to fulfill to, 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 uh, to, uh, to call it uh, autonomous. Um, but I was uh, wondering the first thing which, which actually uh, came to, to, to my mind, and I think uh, this is um, very uh, interesting. I think when, we, when we're talking about the law of the sea, the most interesting topic for, for students especially uh, is the topic of, of the piracy. So uh, what, uh, what, what, what will be the future of the, of the autonomous vessels uh, in, in the context of, uh, of the piracy? Uh, so um, want, uh, want it be, I mean, want, want it be more like invitation for possible pirates, for example, to uh, attack 
back uh, this kind of vessel which uh, which uh, uh, which transporting for example cargo or won't it be um, for example uh, a, a reason to to maybe increase uh, uh, the piracy in the region regions where, where where the piracy doesn't exist right now um what uh, how, how do you see that mm -hmm. Yes, it's actually a very interesting question and it's a very important question, uh, moreover. Of course, the problems related with the piracy and autonomous shipping are very... It's a very big concern for the international community and for the constructors of autonomous and unmanned vessels. As you mentioned exactly, the fact that a vessel is unmanned, so there is no human present on board, would be some kind of an invitation, unfortunately, for the possible pirates and for the other person who wants to commit other type of illegal acts against the safety and security of maritime navigation. Therefore, as uh, we can imagine, at least for the moment, the autonomous element vessels would need to avoid the operation in the regions when there, where there is a high risk of the piracy attacks Currently, these regions, which are especially endangered by the attacks of pirates, is the Gulf of Aden, is the um, other side, uh, east coast of Africa, the delta of uh, the river Niger, and uh, the Caribbean region, the region of the um, Philippines, Thailand. So there are concrete regions in the world when, where we unfortunately know the, par the piracy exists and where this type of ships could be especially exposed. Therefore, in my opinion, at least for the time being, the autonomous and unmanned vessels would need to just operate in, this, in the places, in the areas where the piracy doesn't happen, like the Baltic Sea, the, Nor the, Norway's, uh, the North Sea, sorry, uh, the regions which are just much, much safer, because of course, they would be a very vulnerable for this type of illegal attacks. Okay, um, thank you so much. There is uh, one more question. Um, so uh, you mentioned that the, 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 the autonomous vessel uh, is operating uh, right now in Norway on the, 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 the territorial sea, uh, uh, Nor Nor Norway territorial sea. And uh, so, so basically, uh, the, the, there is no problem uh, because since, since the territorial sea is, is under uh, jurisdiction of, of, of the, the country, uh, the coastal country, so there is no problem with, uh, with, with the, 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 uh, 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 the, for the vessel to traveling, let's say, on the territorial sea. Um, that's my first question, and the second question uh, is actually wh 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 why uh, why we cannot uh, uh, really allow uh, the the autonomous uh, vessel uh, to in, in international traffic. What what are the other uh, you know biggest threats? Uh, uh, why why we cannot introduce them? Uh, first, I mean uh, the first problem is because uh, it it does not fulfill the the, the legal requirements. Uh, but um, uh, let's not talk uh, here, for example, what, what, what are the other threats for, for the autonomous vessels uh, uh, for, for, for the, for the uh, in more international sea? Um, yes, thank you. Yes, so answering the first question, yes, in the case of the national territory, uh, for example, the territorial sea, which is under the jurisdiction of the uh, coastal state, here the situation is much more simple because the state can basically decide if um, the state wants or doesn't want that a certain type of vessel operates within its territorial sea. So as this is a Norwegian project, of course, Norway has very big interest and wants to help the, um, the partnership, the company which is developing the, um, this vessel to be able to operate and to undertake the operational tests because of course this vessel now is constructed, this vessel exists. However, this vessel still has not operated in natural real uh, conditions at sea. So now it's very important to see how this vessel is gonna behave uh, and how it's gonna react to the concrete now real situations which will occur on the sea. And therefore within a territorial sea, it's just uh, the decision of a coastal state. And this is what's happening in the case of Norway. The other question uh, is actually closely related, related with the first one. 
So the international legal order, which prevails at sea, composed by the UNCLOS Convention, composed by all the treaties and conventions of the maritime, International Maritime Organization, all of these conventions put very strict requirements on how the vessel must be constructed, how this vessel must be uh, manned. This vessel must have a captain physically. This vessel must have a crew physically. Every state, uh, every flag state that is a state uh, under which flag a vessel is registered has an obligation to be controlling the compliance of a vessel with the national and international regulations. So because all the international conventions are based exactly on the existence of a crew, crew members, um, captain, so basically a ship without a crew cannot be registered. A ship without a crew cannot have a permission to be engaged in international voyages. So this is more a question of legal regulations, <coughs> I'm sorry, than a question of technical uh, problems. Of course, if we answer this question from a perspective of shipping industry, from a perspective of a maritime navigation, of course, there will be this type of problems like, is this ship is gonna always be technically be able to prevent collisions? What happens if a system fails? What happens if an autonomous ship, which is on the way, um, passes by some people who, for example, fell overboard, some people who require assistance, some people who require help, this, all these obligations, for example, of helping, assisting every person which encounters uh, himself in a danger at sea, also these obligations uh, derive from the international legal, legal regulations. So, for example, how a ship without any human present on board will be able to help anyone? Is it going to be able to help? I guess the answer is negative. I guess the answer is no. So, these are the type of problems. Uh, very much related with the um, international traffic. As you mentioned, the problem of piracy, but then, for example, we have a problem of the terrorist, terrorism. A ship, which is a cargo ship transporting, for example, uh, petroleum, a ship which has some explosive materials uh, on board. Can that ship be autonomous or unmanned? Can this type of goods, this type of dangerous cargo be transported by a ship which is not even supervised but a, by a human element. What if terrorists, for example, want to kidnap this type of a vessel and use it for other illegal activities, threats, uh, causing some type of, for example, terrorist attack? So it's a very, very complex topic with lots of legal and technical problems, which until today has not been answered. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and the last question is, uh, uh, you know, taking into consideration your experience and, and uh, the fact that you are so deep uh, in, in this topic, I would like to ask if, uh, like, what, 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 what do you think, uh, when, when we can expect the first autonomous vessels in, in the open seas, it will be in the next 10 years, it will be in five years, 15, or uh, you think that, that uh, like fully autonomous vessels on, on, on the sea, it's uh, it's 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 rather maybe a farther future. Mm -hmm. I think that this is already a very close future. I think that the fact that these vessels they physically technically exist will really um, accelerate the regulatory works. So as we could see, the IMO already has been working on this problem since two thousand eighteen. Now the regulatory scoping exercise have been completed. There are more and more researchers, uh, legal experts working on this topic. The companies also are pushing for finding the uh, regulatory solutions. So I think that this is a matter of five, maybe 10 years. Uh, and perhaps it will happen faster because always when there, is, um, uh, when there is a will, as we say, there is a way. So I think it's a matter of really short future when these type of vessels will start at least on some concrete route in safe regions with certain type of cargo, of course, in a limited way at first, but will start operating in the international uh, voyages. 
Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barbara. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Uh, Abbasi is with us. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I think uh, that would uh, conclude our session. And uh, thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you so much for, uh, for finding the time uh, to deliver this uh, extremely uh, interesting uh, uh, lecture. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, for more. Uh, I know that you're working right now on, 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 on the uh, research project, which is uh, dedicated only to this topic. So I'm sure that, uh, that soon you will have uh, more information. You will have uh, some more research which uh, you would be able to share with us. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, um, Professor Bata Pollock, for the invitation, for Professor Zubar Abassi. It was a great pleasure and I also hope that uh, soon I will be able to share with you more detailed and more uh, already focalized analysis on concrete issues of autonomous and unmanned vessels. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.